So who would be the standard bearer for the communitarian view in, or one of the standard bearers in the, in the tradition? Yeah. Well, I think the best example is, is Rousseau. Rousseau, uh, in the uh, Discourse on the Origins of Inequality, explicitly takes on Hobbes. Yes. Hobbes supposes that our private goods are inherently conflicting, and they're inherently conflicting because of scarcity. Right. If I want something and you want it, we become enemies. Right. Uh, and because we're rational, and this is really an interesting point about Hobbes, because we're rational, we can see into the future, and we can recognize that we're going to have needs in the future, yes. and therefore we're going to want to have resources today to meet those needs. Right. And so scarcity is augmented by our rationality. Huh. If we were not such rational beings, we'd be like dogs. We'd, be, we'd eat our meal and we'd yes. fall asleep <laughs> until we got hungry again. And Rousseau challenges this notion of, of rationality and scarcity being linked? No, no, he doesn't, he, uh, he doesn't approach it quite that way. So, so the first idea is, is that material, the goods and things that we want to satisfy our appetites are scarce. The second idea is, is that we, the scarcity is augmented by right. this for, uh, capacity to look forward. The third idea is, is that we all have an inherent desire for what Hobbes calls glory. Yes. Or we might think of it as status. Right. Uh, I want to stand above you, you want to stand above me. The thing about status is that it's zero sum by right. definition, because my status is a function of how I stand relative to you. So in, in the beginning of part two, the Leviathan Hobbes poses the question, why do some social animals live together in societies? And he mentions the ants and the bees yes. without some kind of power structure. Right. And his answer is, man whose joy consists in comparing himself with others can d desire only that which is eminent. Mm -hmm. And so yes. it's, that's, the, that's the, in, the intrinsic scarcity. And Rousseau's critique of Hobbes is to say, look, these kinds of desires aren't hardwired. Right. These kinds of desires are a function of the social world in which we live. Yes. And if we live in some kinds of social worlds, we'll develop those kinds of desires. And in those social worlds, there is not much of a common good because if your interests are inherently antagonistic, yes. then there isn't going to be a common good between you. But in other social worlds, where you come to have desires that are compatible with the satisfaction of other people, and therefore no desires that are based upon invidious distinctions of yes. status, then uh, you can have a common good and you can organize the society in accordance with that. So some s societies are organized to promote this pursuit of honor, or what Rousseau sometimes calls vanity, and other and others uh, could they they could organize they could be organized differently yes or be disorganized I guess is another <laughs> way uh, yes well and of course to the extent that honor and so forth are drives of the people in that society right. those societies are likely to be characterized by high levels of competition and violence yes or practices like dueling and other kinds of practices that that uh, lead to violence. Pinker makes a big point of this in uh, his book on the better angels of our nature. Yeah, maybe you can say a word about that because we'll be fast forwarding to, to more contemporary discussions. Uh, Stephen Pinker, who is uh, a psychologist uh, and, and a commentator on social and political issues, um, has has uh, t talked about the potential for overcoming violence, or the actually the historical evolution away from violence. Maybe yes. say a word about that. Yes. Well, uh, Pinker's uh, argument is that we we have moved away from violence both within domestic societies and at the world level as a result of the creation of political structures that secure order. Uh, for large for large numbers of people, and therefore we that people don 't have to as it were rely on self help to forms of defense right and uh, so we 're moving away from the kind of Hobbesian state of nature yes. uh, towards uh, a, a state of, of civil order, and he actually draws on norbert elias 's work on the civilizing oh, process yeah. to discuss that so as you know, in this class we 've read someone who was uh, we start off really with someone who is much more pessimistic. <laughs> Than Professor Pinker uh, <laughs> with Garrett Hardin's uh, uh, essay on the tragedy of the commons, right? right? And that seems to echo Hobbes in the sense that there's, um, although it may not be about honor in, in, in Hardin's case, but there's a sense of, of 
conflict that um, you pursue rationally. I mean, to go back to yeah. the, this notion of seeing into the future, uh, you pursue things rationally, but the, our very rationality leads us to tragic conflict. Right, right. This is the this is that uh, paradox we were talking about before. From an individual point of view, I'm inclined to advance my own private good. Right. Since you're inclined to advance your own private good, we can end up actually creating a situation that's worse for both of us, even though we're being very, we're rationally pursuing our own private goods. Yeah. And uh, Hardin specifically talks about common property situation. So an example would be ocean fisheries. Hmm. Uh, the, uh, we, we've seen, for example, the exhaustion of many of the richest, world's richest fish stocks. And this is a result of the fact that individual fisher, fishers, fishers, fishers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, go into these waters and take up as much fish as they can. Right. And so it's in their self-interest to do so. Exactly, right. And, and so as a result of everybody acting this way, the sustain, they, their total yield uh, exceeds the sustainable level of harvest and over a while the fish stocks begin to die off. Now, in their, in their mutual interest to self to practice self-restraint, right. but they can't do it as individuals because if I restrain myself and you don't, right. I pay the full costs of that self-restraint. I have a smaller right. catch and I don't get any of the benefits. So it's rational to assume that the other guy would, would be a free rider or exactly. would take advantage of the situation. And so re- to, pre- hit, to prevent that or to mitigate its effects, one pursues one's own self-interest, but the result is that everyone is worse off. And we all, st- and we all spiral down, exactly. And that's the same dynamic that Hobbes thought characteri- would characterize the state of nature where we're concerned about security. Um, I want to, to secure myself, and so therefore I see you as, a, as an enemy, and so therefore it makes sense for me to strike first, to get you before you can get me. But yeah. it's exactly the same on your part. And so as a result of this, we're both extremely insecure. And for both Hobbes and Hardin, the only way that they could think of of getting out of this situation is to erect a, f- a form of authority right. that will uh, limit our choices and sanction us, coerce us, if right. we violate those sorts. Because otherwise, we'll all be uh, defecting, we'll all be free riders, uh, and we'll fail to bring about the, the common good. So, so the, you can't, dis- from that perspective, you can't discover or you don't discover the common good or the social good on your own. It has to be uh, drilled into you, so to speak, yeah, by, uh, right. by a, an, author, a, a, an outside authority. Absolutely, and and when we're sp- specifically talking about an, uh, an institution that wields uh, uh, coercive power, the ability to ultimately back up those rules that require our self-restraint with force, yeah. so that it becomes in our own private interest to act in accordance with a rule that promotes. Right. The, the interests of the group as a whole. So we don't have to deal with the authorities who has the power of violence or the power to fine us or, or imprison us. Yeah, of course, that's the, that's the problem. Is that you, have a new, you have a new problem. <laughs> you, you erect the authority to control this problem, and then you get a new one that the authority then becomes exploitative and so forth. So this is, in some ways, the, the flip side of the uh, Adam Smith version, right? Or where, it, where that the pursuit of our individual interest is mutually reinforcing in a, in a way that everyone benefits, that everybody's, the tide goes, comes in, everybody rises. right. And the first law of social science is some are, some aren't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and so what we really need to think about, and what is done in a lot of our courses here at Wesley, and especially in, in uh, the social sciences, economics in particular, sociology, political science, or what we call government here, right. um, is to try to understand the conditions under which a spontaneous self-interested behavior generates good outcomes yeah. for the group as a whole and the conditions under which it doesn't. Right. And so uh, this comes back to Hardin's point about the tragedy of the commons. The first commons, you could say, is the, um, is the land itself. Right. And if you think about, say, the way a hunter-gatherer society operates, they treat the land as a commons. They don't actually take p- physical possession right. of the territory. They harvest the the uh, goods and ser- uh, you know, 
the food, the, the berries, the, <laughs> the, and yeah. so on that they find in nature. And that's fine as long as the carrying capacity of the land is greater than the population of hunter-gatherers. But if the population of hunter-gatherers begins to grow, they will begin to over-harvest, just right. like the fishers right. uh, in, in the ocean fisheries. And as a result of this, it'll degrade the carrying capacity of the land and everybody will be ba badly off. The solution to that problem is privatization. And this is, this is uh, the argument that we find first made in this form by John Locke right. in the Second Treatise of Government. If we divide up the land right. and we move into settled agriculture, the land becomes so much more productive uh, that we will be able to support a much larger population than we could have supported by treating the land as a commons. And we won't degrade it because every individual proprietor has an interest in, his, in, as, in ensuring that the future flow of product from the land will be high because they pay the full cost of any investment or self-restraint they have to make, but they also get the full benefit. Yes. Uh, whereas in the fisheries case that we talked about yeah. a minute ago, they pay the full cost, but they only get a small Marshall fraction benefit. of the yeah. benefit. Yeah. So by, by dividing up the uh, common property resource, that's how yes. Hardin is using the word commons, uh, by, by making it dividing it up into private property, you can so increase productivity, says Locke, yes. that we'll all be better off than we were before. So uh, from Locke's perspective, uh, we don't need such a strong external authority because it's in our self-interest to preserve our land for the future. We're seeing into the future, and in this case, seeing into the future actually helps uh, can, uh, us be more productive? Yes, exactly. That's, I mean, of course, prior to Hobbes, the great philosophers of both the uh, classical Greece and Rome, of the uh, Arab uh, world, of the uh, Christian Middle Ages, all thought that reason was the key to human harmony. Yes. Because through reason, we could grasp the order of things and see what our, where our duties lay and so forth. It's Hobbes is the extraordinary uh, originality yeah. to turn that on its on its head and see reason is actually in some ways the source of our of our discontent yes uh, and and Hardin I guess picks up on that in a way right is because from Hardin's perspective uh, it's also reason uh, it, it's even kind of it's like a, almost I don't know if it's cult we'd call it game theory at that time but if you know the rational perspective will lead us to disaster. Exactly. Why did he think? What was he thinking about at that, that time? Uh, what was the issue? Well, he was specifically thinking about the problem of population, and uh, at that time there was a, a lot of concern that population was growing at a, at unsustainable rates. Right. And the and he was saying. We should think about population or natality decisions, uh, reproductive decisions, as really kind of commons. Yes. Because if the world can only support a certain number of people, right. then whenever you have offspring, you are not simply affecting just yourself or right. your immediate household, you're affecting everybody else in the world. It's that carrying capacity of the planet, I guess, right? Exactly. Yeah, and so he, th he thought that the solution would be to adopt some kind of Authorit authoritative limitations, perhaps of the sort that we saw a few years later in China, mm -hmm. uh, limiting right. what people could do in terms of birth. This is a you know, characteristic kind of Hobbesian solution. Right. You pass a law, you <laughs> enforce the law with the police. Right. <laughs> and he thought, very much along the lines that you were just suggesting, that we can't preach to people and say, you should be responsible, you should practice self-restraint, because those people are, be, in effect, being tr played as chumps. Yeah. Because they'll practice self-restraint, the other people will go on behaving badly, right. and over time, the self-restrainers will disappear from the population. It's kind of an evolutionary. Yes. <laughs> right, because the other people will be having all those children. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, of course, there's a lot of assumptions being made there. Like, if I came from a big family, I'm going to have a big family. Or right. if I'm a breeder, my children will be breeders. But whatever. But I guess that the... the, the 
the article was, uh, you know, it's brief. It's uh, it's um, it seems in some ways delimited, but it caught on so much because perhaps because of this notion that it was our very rationality, the thing we're so proud about, that was leading us to disaster. I mean, I guess in some ways Horkheimer and Adorno made a a, 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 a parallel argument, like it's enlightenment itself is leading to fascism, <laughs> that rationality leads to um, disaster. I mean, there's a, there's a, I guess in the post-war period, there was um, almost a critique of rationality. Does that seem reasonable? That yeah, I, I would actually perhaps say it's a critique of instrumental rationality. Yes. That, yeah. uh, I mean, if we think about, say, a Kantian idea of practical reason, mm-hmm. which involves the idea of finding a rational basis for norms, like the norm of respecting other persons, yes. uh, treating them as ends in themselves, uh, Hob- uh, Kant saw, the, rather in the pre Hobbesian way, as, as, so to speak, Kant saw the development of the human capacity for reason as enabling them to grasp moral principles and therefore to learn how to live with one another yes. uh, and to bring about a situation ultimately of perpetual peace in the world. So that external authority gets internalized, right? We have, the, we have our norms that we conform to because the norms are reasonable and we restrain ourselves rather than needing the cops. <laughs> exactly. And in fact, this is... Well, we probably need Some a little bit of cops in the back. <laughs> there, there's, we don't want to think, I mean, the, of course, the anarchists, I mean, you think about William Godwin, I mean, they thought that we could really do the, do, do the whole thing, and, and there was no need for any kind of external authority. For, for people like Rousseau and Kant uh, and people in that tradition, we need to recognize that we're imperfectly reasonable, yeah. and therefore there's uh, slippage. But... Right. But the idea, the core idea behind the, this Kantian, and, and I, it's actually he got it from Rousseau, I and mean, he always sure. said that everything yes. he learned, but, uh, is the idea of the question of how can we be free and live in society with others? Because if we're living in society, the society has to have an order, otherwise it's just an agglomeration. And if it has an order, then there are rules or norms that we're going to have to conform to in order to bring to create that order. But if I have to conform to those rules, then how can I be free? And their answer is, well, if those rules are rules that you yourself will because you see they're reasonable, and at least that's in, in Kant's terms, uh, then as rational beings... You're conforming to those rules is conforming to your own decisions, yes. and therefore you are free. So, for when Rousseau says oh, freedom, or the highest form of freedom is obedience to a law that you give yourself, Hardin is saying uh, you, you'd be irrational, you'd be a, a chump to give that law to yourself because other people are going to be cheating, and you're at, you're missing out. And worse than that, you you'll disappear. <laughs> exactly. Unless, of course, there's this external authority that's that's sanctioning the, the law. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about the critiques of Harding. Because like, pretty, although it caught on, I mean, it was a, it, it captured the imagination of people. It also gave rise pretty quickly to critiques within economics and in social theory. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the the, I think the, there are a number of critiques, uh, and they begin, they, they move away from Hardin's, or the Hardin slash Hobbes kind of H squared <laughs> <laughs> position um, uh, in an incremental way. There's no bright line here. So we might th- think about the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who right. won the Nobel Prize, uh, and she. Uh, did actually did empirical studies yes. of how social groups manage commons, right. uh, how a farmer is living in a relatively semi-arid area, for example, manage water resources yes. and so on. And she talked about the uh, all kinds of social arrangements through which people could create provide public goods for themselves mm-hmm. without having a centralized system of control and sanctioning mm-hmm. without the, the yes. without the police <laughs> so yes. to speak now there are always police in the sense that um, if we are involved in in a situation that is defined by norms specifying forms of reciprocity right. your failure to conform to those norms will lead your, the people that you're that you're cooperating with to withdraw cooperation right. from you right and so 
as to the extent, for example, that your behavior is visible, right. so we can tell yeah. whether you're yeah. playing by the rules, right. and the extent that uh, we already have a normative structure in place, yeah. then uh, the system can be relatively self-regulating, and we can't because it'll be in your long-term self-interest yes. to conform to the rules. Uh, Not alienating my fellows. Exactly, my, yeah. because the opportunities for reciprocity with others make you so much better off than you would be. It doesn't pay to mm -hmm. to take a one-off and deviate and then uh, have people withdraw from you. This is the kind of core idea behind uh, the idea of social capital. Right. And Bob Putnam, you may have known of his work sure. on Italy, where he compares governmental performance in different areas of Italy yeah. and argues that there are areas of Italy where the civic engagement and political engagement and the self-organizing activities of people in social groups to provide themselves with um, various goods beginning in sort of the late Middle Ages with security and, yeah. um, and moving forward into the modern period with technology, knowledge, education, mm -hmm. and so forth, creates a uh, high level of social capital and high levels of governmental performance in these areas, yeah. where other areas uh, created uh, very low levels of uh, civic engagement and low levels of government performance. And the irony is, is that the, the areas with the low levels of, of uh, civic culture were areas that had the pure Hobbesian yes. solution. <laughs> yeah. Because they have the problem, they create this uh, strong government which actually doesn't solve the problem, it creates other problems, right? Right, yeah. and, it and, and, and it tends to break up the one-on-one uh, -on -one relationships among people yes. that, that generates these webs of interconnectedness and so forth. And there's an economic basis to this as well, because right. in the north, where you had these things, you had small proprietorships and you had uh, uh, artisan, artisanal-based uh, economies and that sort of thing, whereas in the south, you had large <coughs> landowners and, uh, you know, plantation, well, what we would call today plantation-style agriculture. In, uh, and you see the same thing in the United States, where in the north, you had very strong uh, you know, very, lots of small independent yes. proprietors uh, developing, as Tocqueville noted yeah. <laughs> years ago, these uh, associational life where they cooperated together to meet their mutual needs and so forth. Whereas in the South, with the system of slavery and the system and the large plantations and so forth, you didn't have these kinds of things. And the North is the bastion of democracy, high levels of social capital and so forth. Yeah. So.